Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. As you can see, we're going to start worship with our choir this morning before we do. We're going to continue through Romans chapter 13. And uh, Romans chapter 13, when you hear the reading today, you're going to be like, ooh, I don't know if I like those words from Paul. They're pretty direct for us. And we're going to dive right into it. I guarantee you it's not an easy chapter again for us from Paul. But he gives us his instruction as through God. And so we'll dive into Romans chapter 13 for our for our, our message today. We do have communion today, so just a reminder, you know, when the, when the uh, uh, elders come by, the first one will have the individual cups, and the second one will have the, the common cup for communion. So let's begin our worship. Okay. And the, you'll follow the screens along, but the, the choir will begin, and then the congregation will join in. You can see it up on the screens. I invite you to please stand as you're able. Mm-hmm. 
We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Father, when we confess the wrongs we've done, you assure us we are made clean, our sins are forgiven, and you remember our sins no more. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sins I have committed against you, Father, please forgive me. For the sins I have committed against others, Father, please forgive me for the sins I have left undone when I failed to follow your commandments. Father, please forgive me for the sins only you and I know that I have committed. Father, please forgive me for these sins and all others that you know I have committed. I justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Forgive me, renew me, and lead me, so that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God hears our confession, and Jesus, his son, paid the price on the cross to take away our guilt, shame, and sin. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore can once again tell you of the grace of God given to each of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost is from Ezekiel chapter 33. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this thing, very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owed, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please stand as you're able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you, it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine to go the, on, the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than, the, than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, go tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even to the church, let him, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whoever, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it would be done for them by my Father in heaven. For when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated.
Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you speak through me this morning. Lord, may the words that come from my mouth give honor to you and to your holy word. Please continue to guide me with your words to send and equip this flock to grow your family and show your love. I ask all of us in the name of our crucified and resurrected Savior who died and rose for our sins. Amen. Hello, friends. Well, today, I said we've been continuing through our sermon series in Romans, and today, we're in chapter 13. Chapter 13. What are two things we are told not to talk about when family gets together? Religion and politics, right? So don't read chapter 13 of Romans to them, all right? If you're on the Thanksgiving table. You see, some would read these words from Paul today in Romans 13 and use it to support political views and reasons why they do or do not support an elected or appointed government official or governmental office. I will not be talking about politics today. Politics has no place from where I'm standing in the pulpit. I am going, I'm not going to spend my time talking about politics today instead of talking about Jesus Christ. Romans 13, as we've already alluded to, is one of those rings. You have to be careful not to lose focus on what Paul is trying to tell us as Christians. I bet you if you listen to 100 sermons on Romans chapter 13, you're going to get 100 very different messages. Because people and pastors and churches have twisted the meaning of this chapter to fit their purpose. And when you do that, that's heresy and that's wrong. As I was preparing for the message this week, I kept hearing the voice of my seminary professors in the back of my head. Preach the text okay preach the text chapter 13 is not an easy one for us is it in today's climate in the world we live in today but you notice that Paul from last week he continues on this theme from last week to live in harmony with one another chapter 13 Paul tells us to continue to live in harmony and that includes the government so live in harmony with the government, no matter how much you do or do not like it. Paul writes, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. The president, the governor, the mayor, your senator, your representative, your state representatives, the county assessor, all of the boards in the county, Washington, D.C., the state capitol in Des Moines, the city hall, the county courthouse, the Internal Revenue Service, all of those government offices and others that I didn't mention, I am to subject myself to these as Christians. What if I don't like them? What if I don't agree with them? What if they are doing things that go against God's word? Paul says yes. Paul says yes, we are, to subject, we are to be subjecting to the government authorities. In fact, the word subject is a military term here, meaning to march in the proper order. So this isn't a mere suggestion from Paul. This is more of an order from Paul. Does that mean that we have to agree with him? No. Does it mean that we have to vote for him? No. Does it mean that we have to like what they're doing? No, we do not. I consider one of the greatest privileges we have as Christians is to pray for others. That's why almost on a weekly basis in our prayers for service, we pray for those who hold government offices. 
Because me posting something on the internet or giving my opinion, that's not going to change our government leaders. But God can. I look at Paul, and if God can change Paul's heart, I'm most certain that he can change the heart of a government official. So in your prayers, pray for our leaders, whether you agree with them or you don't. Think about these words as Paul is writing them. Remember who the ruler of the Roman Empire is at this time. It's Nero. And to put it plainly this, Nero was a bad dude. If you think things are worse now than they were when Paul wrote these words under Nero, go out to, Ro- go out to Google, type in Romans 13, Nero, N-E-R-O, and see what comes up. And read about Nero and his family history and the things that he did. You will find that the time that Paul wrote this, times were probably much worse than they are now. We know that Nero persecuted the Christians. We know that Nero had Paul in prison and put to death. When the city of Rome burned, Nero blamed the Christians when he was the one whose actions instigated the uprising. But Paul remembers how the Jews lived in harmony with Rome in the Promised Land. Remember the Jews, they despised having Romans rule over them. Although Jews had occasionally clashed with Roman authorities, They had long recognized the wisdom in supporting governments under which they lived. Paul encourages similar attitudes among Christians. You see, Paul's words for us today are inclusive for us as Christians. Because all authority originates from God. God is the highest authority to whom ultimate obedience is due, both from those in authority and under it. Remember when the people of Israel settled in the Promised Land? God sent a judge to rule over the people because God wanted the people to have only one king. God alone. But the people wanted a king like the other people had. And they told God they wanted a king. 1 Samuel chapter 4. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no. But there shall be a king over us that we may also be like all the other nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight fight our battles. How does God respond? And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. When we go against the plans of God, we reject God being king over us. I am not, I repeat, I am not defending any political politician or leader anywhere. But there is a reason that each and every man or woman has been elected to their respective office. God is using them in ways, some ways we do not understand at times. They are, service, they are serving us in an office instituted by God. You see, God instituted good order in this world in our country, in our state, in our city. And thank God he did. Otherwise, could you imagine what life would be like without good order? It would be pure anarchy. It would be chaos. It would be every man or woman for themselves. Survival of the fittest. Paul backs up his words in verse 1 with a warning in verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, resist what God has appointed And those who resist will incur judgment. Remember from previous weeks when Paul writes, therefore. Usually Paul was starting a new thought or a new teaching. But in this case, Paul is backing up what he is saying in the previous verse. Subject yourselves to the governing authorities that God has instituted. And if you don't, therefore, you will incur judgment. Christians may at times resist governmental authorities on account of God's word. And it's right to do so. But, they better be ready to suffer the consequences of the law. There have been Christians who have protested against the government because of the things the government is doing, and in doing so they crossed the line and broke the law. 
And when they broke the law, they must be ready to accept the consequences. Paul goes on to write, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For Christians, our conduct towards those in authority should be peaceful and respectful. What about bad rulers? There are bad rulers, and they receive their authority from God. They serve in offices given by God, but fortunately God does not dictate how they use it. Politicians abuse their office. Governments abuse their authority. Once again, Paul is not telling us to accept bad or even corrupt governments. Paul is telling the Christians in Rome and us today that we should be respectful and peaceful towards these leaders and governments. Something I'm afraid that we're seeing less and less of these days. Because showing respect does not mean that I like or agree with someone. I remember many times how I reacted when I didn't like the rules my parents enforced. Right? But I was always taught to show them respect. As I look back, I usually got in bigger trouble when I disrespected my parents than when I didn't follow the rules. Paul continues in Romans chapter 13. For he is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. God's servants are those in positions of authority who are to serve God and people. Paul is writing here, God allows governments to use the sword to punish those who do wrong. On the other hand, Christians are not to take vengeance into their own hands, but to leave it to God, the highest authority. You see, Paul doesn't stop with just respecting and following the governments and officials. He includes other things in our readings today, that we may not, that things that we may want to withhold when we feel we are wrong. Paul writes, For the same reason you shall also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. I was doing a little research on taxes and it seems that taxes has never been a popular thing through the history of man. But it seems to me that taxes have been around since about the time of Adam and Eve. They've been around forever. The old expression is true, right? Two things you could count on in this life. Death and taxes, right? Romans, at the time that Paul wrote these words, paid two types of taxes. Direct and indirect taxes. Now the indirect taxes were so unpopular it led to riots and uprising. At one point, Roman Emperor Nero promised the people of Rome he would cancel all the indirect taxation. Well, it must have been an election promise because he never followed through with those words. You see, those who believe Jesus is the one true Lord of the world might well use that belief to rationalize withholding taxes because it agreed with their pagan contemporaries that also thought that taxes were unjust. But Paul stands against this. Christians were likely at this time to get into quite enough trouble for far more serious things. As Paul himself knew from his own experience. But he's saying we should be good citizens for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom of God. Besides Paul's instructions on taxes, Jesus gave us instruction on taxes. From Matthew chapter 22. Jesus says, show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar. And he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, 
and to God the things that are God's. You see, Paul doesn't just address taxes. He adds loans and revenue and respect and honor. When a Christian is living in harmony with others and with the government instituted by God, we pay our loans, we pay our taxes, we pay the revenue that, we are, that is owed, and in doing so, we show honor and respect. Because we show honor and respect in every facet of our lives. When you cheat someone, or you get creative on your taxes, does it nag at you a little bit? It should. That is now how God, through Paul, instructs us how to live. Because that nagging feeling that you're feeling, that's the Holy Spirit. That's our helper, we know. But it also convicts us. Is cheating someone else or the government on your your taxes a sin? It is. But Paul, things are so much different today. Your words applied then, but today we don't even feel like we can trust the government. When was the last time you felt like a politician spoke the truth? Is there any corner of civic service where we would not find corruption? Seems even the school boards are being influenced and questioned today. Where are we supposed to turn? We turn to God, don't we? Because if you place your hopes in the things of this world, it's going to let you down time and time again. There is nothing in this world that comes before God, but we try, don't we? We place more more importance on our own accomplishments, our bank accounts, our government, our political leaders. And when we do, we make those into idols. And when we make something into idol in our life, it's a God that we place before God. We think we're in control. We worry about the government and its political leaders thinking they are in control. God is in control. God has instituted government, rules, and good order so our lives are not in chaos. Jesus set the example for us. Jesus stood before Pilate and declared that. Even though Pilate was about to execute him, the power which he did it didn't come from him. It came from God. John chapter 18, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been, wouldn't have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world talked about this before, but we as Christians, we live in two kingdoms. We live in the earthly kingdom and the kingdom of God. And those two kingdoms are not equal. Everything that is in the earthly kingdom is because of what's been done through the kingdom of God. God is the ruler of the whole world, and he rules in two ways. God rules the worldly or left-hand kingdom through government, utilizing and enforcing the law. In the heavenly and the right-hand kingdom, God reigns through the gospel and through grace. The two kingdoms we live in is simply another form of those words we hear so many times in catechism. Law and gospel. In a sermon from 1528, Martin Luther preached on two kingdoms. In that sermon, Martin Luther states, How the worldly left-hand kingdom includes everything that we can see and do in our bodies. It fully and especially includes whatever is done in the church. This is taught so it is clear that in the heavenly, the right-hand kingdom, the only thing included there is faith alone in Christ, Luther said. Luther used the phrase at that time, two governments in his sermon, which was later changed to two kingdoms. Luther preached that the church should not exercise worldly government and princes should not rule over the church or have anything to do with the salvation of souls. Luther taught that all government in the world and established rule and laws were instituted and ordained by God for the sake of good order and that Christians may without sin occupy offices and serve as princes and judges, render decisions, pass sentences according to existing laws, punish evildoers with the sword, engage in just wars, serve as soldiers, 
buy and sell, take required oaths, possess property, and be married. That's not Luther's opinion. It came directly from Romans chapter 13. Romans has been used and abused by many people in power. One way is telling their subjects to keep their mouth shut and to mute any resistance, even in the face of flagrant abuse. It's also been used in twisted ways by those that oppose the government or political leaders. But when we put the verses back into their context of Romans chapter 13, we see what Paul is getting at. He has just said strongly and repeatedly that vengeance is absolutely forbidden by Christians. Because we as Christians, if we're known as lawless rebels and malcontents concerning the authorities, then what's the world going to think of us when they're watching with us respect to our obedience to Christ himself? This does not mean on one hand God does not care about evil. Or on the other hand, God wants society to collapse into chaos. In fact, in all countries that I know of, even in countries where the people hate the authorities and fear the police, when someone commits a serious crime, everyone affected by it wants good authorities and good police who will find the culprit and administer justice. That is a basic and correct human instinct. We do not want to live by the law of the jungle. We want to live as human beings in an ordered, properly functioning society. Tomorrow's 9-11, and I was thinking, I was writing this. Think how much differently the aftermath of 9-11 would have been handled without God creating for us good, properly functioning society and good order. With all that, let me ask you a question. Do you trust government politicians? Can I ask you another question? Do you trust God? Most of us would honestly say today in this day and age, I don't trust the government, and I don't trust most politicians. But yet I trust God fully. Remember who's in control. It's not the government or the politicians. God is in control. Yet we focus on the government and not on God. God instituted good order in this life for us through government and laws. And there's many times we may question, really God? When we see what a politician or a government is doing, I wonder, what is God up to in all of this? Through all of this, God has never stopped pursuing each one of us. And God continues to show us and our country and our government and our politicians grace. You see, as Christians, our faith is not in the things of this world, it's not in the government, it's not in our politicians. Our faith alone is in God, who through his son Jesus Christ saved each and every one of us from this life so that we may live with him in eternity. And in eternity, I'm going to tell you this right now, there's no need for government. In eternity, we will worship one king, the king of kings, the king above all kings. And that is the king that we follow first and foremost in this life as we live in the kingdom of this earth. Amen? Let us pray. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding be with us all. Amen. At this time, the ushers will come forward and collect the offering.
invite you to stand as you're able. As Christians, we confess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I ask you, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we know that you created everything and us and created good order for our lives. In times that we wonder and question our government authorities, remind us that you alone are in control. You are our king. We ask that you continue to guide us and guard us against the enemy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the children and the teachers who will begin Sunday school today. Jesus taught us to have the faith of a child. Let us look to the children to remind us of what a child faith childlike faith we all have we also ask that you make us humble like little children seeing how your son humbled himself for us and for our salvation lord in your mercy gracious father because you have made us our brother's keeper fill us with care for our members of our earthly family families and for our brothers and sisters in christ forgive our sins and strengthen us to live so that we may owe no one anything except love lord in your mercy Protect those who defend us from our enemies afar and be with those who enforce the laws within our communities. We also ask that you continue to guide those who serve us in government. Be with our president, our congress, our governor, state and local officials, our judges and our magistrates, that they may discern the right path and lead us with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, today we pray for those who suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We name before you this morning, Ron. Dan, Elaine, Gay, Darcy, Diana, James, Mike, Paul, Paula, Sally, Russ, Rod, Pastor Maskey, Rose, and those we name personally at this time. We ask that you would give relief and care to their pain and illness according to your will. We also pray for nurses and doctors and all caregivers who tend to the sick and hurting. Lord, in your mercy, thank you for the gift of the Lord's Supper today. For all who receive Christ's body and blood this day, that they may, receive, may rejoice to receive the Lord's forgiveness through this precious gift. Be strengthened in times of doubt and be nourished in body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, all these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. O Lord our God, we give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of the cross of Jesus Christ and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us only in his body and his blood. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he, gave it, he, gave it to, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
Come, partake in this meal in mystical union with Christ, for unto all who receive His true body and blood and approach it in a worthy way, Jesus opens His arms in welcome and offers sweet communion. This do in remembrance of me. Amen.
invite you to stand as you're able. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with His favor and He gives you His peace. Amen. Let's remain standing for our last song. announcements for you this morning. Sunday school does start off this morning, and a uh, reminder for the adults, if you've been uh, taking a little summer break for Bible study, now's a good time to join us. We're going to have a very interesting discussion this morning about Romans chapter 13 downstairs. Uh, reminder that the book's in the library, uh, they're, they're on the table if you want to look through those today, uh, otherwise we're going to box those up and they'll be uh, gone after 10.30 service today. Um, elders meet, not this coming week. Uh, but next week, so just a reminder in there a little bit ahead of time, so elders meet a week from tomorrow at 7 o'clock, and board of directors meet a week from Tuesday at 6.30. Oh, there's a ladies' event. I can't forget about that. That's next Saturday. Yep, it's next Saturday. We had it wrong, or I had it wrong in the yes, newsletter. Yes, I need to clarify that. So Saturday. there's a correction. So if you look in the newsletter, it says the 24th. Yeah. yeah. It's actually the 16th next Saturday, so... Next Saturday, the 16th, food and fellowship, and there'll be a Bible study and some other activities. If you have any questions, ask Leslie or Nancy back there. Any more other announcements this morning? Go in peace. Have a great week.